Hello, I'm Keith Luce with the National Committee on North Korea. I'm pleased, along with my colleagues um, Esther M. and Daniel Wirtz, to join you today. For those of you who may not be familiar, NCNK is an American-based private organization dedicated to promoting principled engagement between the United States and the DPRK. We have about 100 members. Uh, they include nuclear scientists, former diplomats, representatives of humanitarian organizations, academics, ag specialists, and others. And so our diverse group is involved in a range of activities promoting engagement, track twos, uh, humanitarian assistance to North Korea. From the NCNK perspective as well, we work to provide public information for policymakers and others about North Korea. But this is, today is a real privilege to join with the East Asia Foundation. And this is a timely meeting in terms of trying to jumpstart negotiations, how to go about this. I mean, indeed, we've had, we had the recent summit between the ROK and the US, uh, but I would also add that this meeting is timely given the number of currents uh, operating within North Korea. And as those currents are operating, moving around, uh, at some point when they converge, uh, North Korea will be ready to engage, perhaps with the ROK, with the United States, uh, and we have to be ready. We have to be thinking through uh, what that would look like, both from the ROK and the USN. So having said that, uh, I'm pleased now to turn to Chairman uh, Sung Won Kim and to thank him uh, for co-sponsoring this project with us. Thank you, Kiss. Uh, good morning and uh, <clears throat> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to have the first webinar with the National Committee on North Korea on how to jumpstart and sustain diplomacy with North Korea. Uh, on behalf of East Asia Foundation, I wish to express my thanks to all the participants in this session, and I sincerely welcome all of you. Uh, taking this opportunity, I wish to express my special thanks to Executive Director Keith Luz of NCNK for his efforts to make this webinar more rewarding and fruitful. I also wish to express my gratitude to today's speakers, Dr. Lee Moon Jung, Associate Professor of Gongju National University, and Ms. Susan Sonton. Uh, she is the uh, Project Director of Forum on Asia Pacific Security of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And she is also a former Acting Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. And Mr. Frank Um, Senior Expert on North Korea at the US Institute of Peace, and Professor Moon Jung In. Chairman of the Sejong Institute and the former Special Advisor to Korean President for Unification and National Security Affairs. And I also wish to convey my thanks to my longtime friend, uh, Dr. Kesley Moon, Professor of Political Science at the Wellesley College for moderating this webinar. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, since the second summit between President Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un ended without agreement, in February 2019 in Hanoi, the nuclearization talks between the US and North Korea and South North Korea dialogue have remained stuck in a stalemate. As you remember, just three years ago, President Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un had their historic summit in Singapore and agreed to work toward complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. However, Despite this agreement between the US and North Korea, no progress has been made in the North Korean nuclear issue. Uh, there have been no bold follow on measures to support the Singapore agreement, and there have been no common understanding on the definition of a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. In the meantime, North Korea expressed their frustration of continued sanctions and resumed these provocations by firing a new type of solid fuel, short range ballistic missiles. Breakup of Hanoi summit affected South North relations as well, and North Korea took measures to strain relations with South Korea, which has been amicably maintained since President Moon and Chairman Kim 
had three summits and produced Panmunjom Declaration in 2018. Furthermore, COVID-19 situation and North Korea's decision not to participate in the Tokyo Summer Olympics made the situation worse. So it is disappointing to see that situation on the Korean Peninsula has not been improved despite strenuous efforts by the South Korean government to establish peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. I believe that the most compelling task at this moment is to revive dialogue momentum with North Korea and now is the right time to make diplomatic efforts toward North Korea. In the first summit held last month in Washington, DC, President Biden and President Moon reaffirmed their common belief that diplomacy and dialogue are essential to achieve the complete denuclearization and establishment of permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula based on previous inter-Korean and US DPRK commitments such as the 2018 Panmunjom Declaration and Singapore Joint Statement. President Biden also expressed his support for inter-Korean dialogue and appointed Ambassador Sung Kim as the special US envoy for North Korea. As President Biden and President Moon expressed their willingness to engage North Korea, I hope North Korea would not lose this window of, window of opportunity and come to dialogue with the South Korea and the US. And I sincerely wish that today's webinar will provide valuable wisdom on how to restart dialogue with North Korea. Uh, before I conclude my remarks, uh, let me take a few moments to introduce East Asia Foundation. East Asia Foundation was organized in 2005 with a generous funding from Hyundai Motor Company with a view to broaden knowledge networks. We have maintained exchanges with a number of institutions and universities in the United States, Japan, and China. And we also publish a quarterly English journal, Global Asia. Once again, thank you to all of you for participating in the first webinar uh, jointly organized by the NCNK and East Asia Foundation. I particularly wish to express my thanks to those who laboriously prepared today's meeting. Thank you for your attention. And now I give the floor to today's moderator, Dr. Kathleen Moon. Kathleen, floor is yours. <clears throat> Apparently, Cassie's computer is not working well. Uh, rather than taking the time to provide uh, introductions of each of our speakers. I would like to go ahead um, and, and begin uh, this part of the program by receiving perspective um, uh, first uh, from Professor Chung and Moon on the topic today. Would you proceed? And it, I was, uh, anyhow, it is great to see all of you and, uh, and, and particularly it is, the, it is our third, you know, the, opportunity to cooperate with, uh, you know, National Committee on North Korea. And Keith, thank you very much uh, for co-organizing this event. And also Esther, thank you very much for organizing it. And today's event has a very special meaning. We have a more female, you know, panelist than the male panelist. That's very, very unusual, uh, particularly on the events between Washington and Seoul. That's, I think, very good news. Now, gender power is changing in South Korea, too. Uh, I was asked to uh, give a South Korean perspective on how to jumpstart diplomacy, okay, re with regard to the North Korean uh, nuclear problem. And I'll come with several, you know, wish list on the part of South Korea, okay. I uh, mostly interact with progress forces in South Korea, therefore I know their wish list. As to our government, our government has been very, very careful and cautious other than our Minister of Unification, Yi Inyoung. Yi Inyoung came up with all kinds of wish lists, but uh, apparently Blue House Foreign Ministry uh, are not happy with you know, Minister Lee's in a wish list. But anyhow, we, uh, we were very you know, uh, uh, you know, encouraged by President Biden's endorsement of the idea of South Korea 
uh, having dialogue with North Korea, engaging with North Korea, and having fuller cooperation with North Korea. Of course, there's one in a condition. The condition is, you know, through uh, complete cal calibration with the United States. But other than that, the signal that uh, President Biden you know, blesses South Korean effort to have dialogue with North Korea, engage with North Korea, and uh, full cooperation with North Korea is a really good sign. Then what South Koreans would want to, to jumpstart the dialogue? Obviously, number one issue is uh, allocate U.S. joint military exercise, which is scheduled in August. Uh, Unless we resolve that issue, it is very unlikely that North Korea would come back to us for dialogue. North Korea might be very, very hesitant to have a dialogue with the United States because North Koreans regard joint military exercise, no matter how, what type, because the, our Ulti Freedom Guardians, Guardians in exercise in August is nothing but CPX, you know, the commanding exercise without mobilization of uh, active soldiers, okay? However, North Korea has been arguing that there is a sign of hostile intention and pulse by the United States. Therefore, first thing is whether our government, after consulting the United States, announced that the August military, joint military exercise will be suspended. Okay? Not reducing size, that that may not work on North Korea suspending joint military exercise. That was the one most important variable through which we can tell whether North Korea will come back to dialogue or not. Another item is obviously humanitarian assistance, okay? President Moon mentioned the possibility of a vaccine cooperation with North Korea. We know we are short of in you know, a vaccine, but uh, we are expecting that, that South Korea would become a you know, vaccine production hub uh, for not only for the region, but also for the world, okay? There is another important and you know, a seminal agreement between the United States and South Korea on May 21st. Therefore, you know, obviously, assistance vaccine to North Korea. Another one is you know, uh, food aid to North Korea. Yesterday, uh, you know, uh, what the, ch the chief secretary, you know, Chong Sogi, general secretary, uh, you know, mentioned about the, you know, acute shortage of food as its implication for North Korean economy. Their food aid would be another you know, possibility. Third one is fertilizer. It is time for fertilizer. If we miss this time, then you know, fall harvest of food in North Korea we might have a devastating consequences. Therefore, vaccine, food, fertilizer. Uh, if we can come up with a proactive measure to open North Koreans, not openly, but through the so-called informal communication channel with North Korea, then may work as a jump starter. And third one is what you know, our unification minister Yin Yang has been arguing, because those South Korean small medium firms uh, who uh, which own a uh, production facility in Kaesong Industrial Complex have never been to there. Okay. And therefore, they are desperate to go back and check their inner plans. Therefore, Ministry of Unification is really pushing hard that the, they should be allowed to visit Kaesong Industrial Complex. Okay. But again, in the Minister of you know, Foreign Affairs and et cetera, said it's too early. We should have a fuller cooperation with the United States. But if we voluntarily open Kaesong Industrial Complex, not production, and activities, just for the on-site inspection of facilities, that would send a very good signal to North Korea. Another one is so-called the resumption of a gas and industrial complex, not in old way, but the new way. That means an individual tourist visit to you know, Mount Gumgang would be another incentive because North Korea is interested in resuming gas and the uh, Mount Gumgang tourist in a project because uh, you know, Chairman Kim Jong-un has been paying a lot of attention to the Wonsan area. Wonsan tourist area has a direct connection with the Mount Gumgang project. Therefore, by jump-starting Mount Gumgang tourist project, it can create a ripple effect or positive linkage effect to the effect to the Wonsan tourist project. Therefore, you know, 
uh, North Korea might, you know, uh, you know, accept it in you know, an incentive. Okay, but other than uh, we can come up with other, you know, wish list. For example, President Biden and President Moon Jae-in talked about carbon neutrality. North Korea has a lot of aging thermal power plants. They should be replaced. For example, in Pyongyang, there is a Pyongyang thermal power plant and uh, East Pyongyang, Dong Pyongyang thermal power plant. They need to be replaced. And if we can come up with a more efficient you know, power plant, okay, they can, uh, you know, they can really reduce the carbon emission, emission in Pyongyang and North Korea might take it because Chairman Kim Jong-un has been, you know, championing carbon neutrality. Another issue is what, the, you know, the partial reconnection of a railroad system, starting with the East Coast railroad, you know, system. That could be another possibility. And all those things could serve as some kinds of jump status to North Korea. Because what is really interesting is this, and particularly since the May 21st ROK US summit, North Korea through various channels have been arguing that uh, South Korea should implement Panmunjom Declaration, particularly Article 1 of Panmunjom Declaration talk about inter-Korean exchange and cooperation. But we haven't delivered what we promised to North Korea. This North Korea has been urging us to deliver what is, what is promised in Panmunjom Declaration. But all I mentioned uh, could constitute a Panmunjom Declaration. Therefore, there could be, you know, uh, that could serve as a very important incentive to North Korea. But here is whether North Korea will respond to us, even if South Korea come up with that kinds of proposals. You know, COVID-19 is one factor. Another factor is the domestic economic difficulties. Okay, and therefore they believe they can solve the problem. They should solve the problem through self-reliance strategy. There could be variable. Third, if things get better, particularly COVID-19, North Korea may have a talk with China rather than South Korea. Okay, therefore there are several other variables. But one thing, one positive thing is this. Whenever North Korea is not happy with, uh, if North Korea was not happy with, uh, you know, May 21st, ROK US joint summit statement, they should have come up with a you know, flurry of criticism on it, but so far no criticism. That's a good sign, but it has taken too long time, almost three weeks, not good sign, okay? Therefore they should come up with some, you know, they should come up to some you know, dialogue, whatever, within this month. If we, they, you know, misses this, the month of June, they need to be very difficult for Moon Jae-in government to do anything. Because starting from September, we'll be entering presidential election campaign. Even if North Korea shows good deal gesture, then that will be another northern wind, meaning North Korea interfering with South Korean domestic politics. Therefore, June is most critical in our months. And finally, as President Biden and President Moon Jae-in have agreed that the Washington wants us to have a fuller cooperation and calibration with you know, United States. Therefore, I come up with a list of our wistful, you know, wistful, you know, thinking. But to what extent the US is willing to tolerate all those kinds of things? And to what extent, you know, sanction committee okay, of United Nations Security Council would be willing to support all these things? That is a big, you know, task. And most importantly, to what extent President Moon Jae-in can persuade the South Korean domestic audience about doing this one. It is not good, particularly since North Korea's, you know, really the demolition of, you know, our liaison office in Kaesong. Uh, our citizen sentiment is so bad against North Korea. And I don't know to what extent President Moon Jae-in can succeed in, you know, persuading people's mind. I'll stop here. I think I exceed more than five minutes. Sorry for that one. That is that is all right. Uh, thank you for that excellent overview, uh, your perspective on jump-starting negotiations. Now we'll turn to Frank Om with the U.S. Institute of Peace.
Uh, thank you very much, Keith, and thank you to NCNK and East Asia Foundation for inviting me to share my thoughts. I'm going to try to be as concise as possible and, and see if I can stick to the five minutes. Uh, I don't like hearing myself talk too long either. So I think uh, the U.S. policy towards North Korea, in my opinion, appears to be a common sense approach using a calibrated balance of carrots and sticks. But the bottom line is that the U.S. believes that the ball is now in North Korea's court to respond. Secretary Blinken mentioned this. But I think North Korea's posture is less clear. It did say that it would respond to the U.S. Uh, based on the principle of power for power and goodwill for goodwill. And it certainly didn't appreciate the recent flexing of U.S. power, like Biden's promise to deal with North Korea with stern deterrence, the alliance's lifting of South Korea's revised missile guidelines, or the, the naming and shaming of North Korea's human rights violations. But it's not clear how North Korea is receiving uh, some of the goodwill gestures that were present in Biden's North Korea policy. So I think the first realistic step in jumpstarting diplomacy is for North Korea to agree to an initial meeting. At a minimum, I think the North would wanna at least uh, get more details in a confidential setting about the US policy, as well as share its own thinking about what it wants. The meeting could take uh, place in Pyongyang or maybe virtually with less classified materials if North Korea is worried about COVID exposure. And if it likes what it hears, then great. Uh, we like to get back to talks. Uh, if not, then at least there's more clarity on both sides. Now, if North Korea continues to be hesitant uh, about returning to talks, then I still think the U.S. should consider a range of unilateral conciliatory uh, gestures to pave the way for sustained communications and negotiations with North Korea. Because the reality today is that North Korea is an insecure country uh, that has nuclear weapons, but there's a real deficit of trust, understanding, and communications on both sides. So to really strengthen our security, uh, we shouldn't just be focusing on deterrence and pressure. We need to maximize our engagement with North Korea at all levels. Now, I know that the Biden administration is, is averse to this and would probably prefer to you know, be strategically patient and increase pressure, but past history has demonstrated that this is not an effective path. I'll point to the six-year period between 2012 and 2018 in which the U.S tried to isolate North Korea and apply pressure. This period coincided with the greatest advances in North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Four nuclear tests, over 90 ballistic missile tests, more production of fissile material. Also, I would note that each major agreement that we've reached with North Korea in the past was always precipitated by a major crisis. I think we need to figure out a way to skip the crisis part, the cycle of provocations, and get right back to talks. So what are some of the unilateral conciliatory gestures that the US could offer upfront that wouldn't undermine, uh, at least significantly, our defense and deterrence? Well, I think there's a lengthy list of options that we uh, could choose from. I'll just go down the list. A willingness to declare an end to the Korean War a more definitive statement from the president about seeking new USDPRK relations, a willingness to establish an immediate working group on a peace regime that runs parallel with denuclearization talks, uh, a willingness to have a presidential summit to codify an interim agreement, a moratorium on the deployment of US strategic and nuclear assets to the Korean Peninsula, North Korea brings this up a lot, a modification or suspension of the August military exercises uh, that's commensurate with the scaling down of the Korean People's Army exercises. Uh, similarly, a willingness to begin senior level military to military talks with the KPA, an end to the travel ban to North Korea, a willingness to enhance North Korean academic and training exchanges in the US once COVID subsides. And of course, as Dr. Moon mentioned, uh, humanitarian and nutritional food assistance uh, COVID vaccine assistance as well. And I think these gestures uh, should be made with an invitation for North Korea to reciprocate with its own gestures. And I think these gestures could include 
Of course, a moratorium on nuclear and ballistic missile tests and activities, including enrichment and reprocessing, an immediate return to talks and re-engaging with South Korea, a reciprocal suspension or modification of KPA exercises, additional remains, uh, remains recovery operations for the US service members remaining from the Korean War, uh, and a willingness to dismantle its facilities at Yongbyon and Tongchangmi, establish liaison offices, receive UN and US special envoys on human rights, and for virtual and later in-person reunions of divided family members. Ultimately, I think we need to get into a virtuous cycle of reconciliation as we saw a little bit in 2018. And uh, in my opinion, I think the US is in the best position to assume some risks towards peace and take the first steps given our robust defense and deterrence posture. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, we, we've heard now from Dr. Chung and Moon. We've heard from Frank Kam. Uh, we will turn to Dr. Uh, Yun Jung Lim. Uh, but before we do, uh, Kathy Moon, are you back with us now? Can't hear you. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. We cannot see you, but we can hear you, so that's fine. There okay. we, there you are. There you are. Uh, so, Kathy, big apologies. Uh, the whole system just was not working. I had to use another uh, device. But... We'll turn it over to you, and and now uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Yun Jung Lim. Great. Again, thank you very much for having me tonight for me and the morning for you. Again, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my great opportunity and pleasure uh, to join this wonderful dialogue with the distinguished panelists and the distinguished audiences. Let me just go to uh, my four points, actually, directly uh, to save our time. So again, number one point I'd like to highlight is, again, so-called the two-level game, robot partners that two-level game game has been um, and is likely to be um, increasingly more and more important, um, of course, in South Korea and probably in the United States too. South Korea, I don't think South Korea is a uh, kind of idiosyncratic case uh, in this context. Um, you know, for example, the US presidential election was a good example uh, to think about all this, you know, nature of uh, polarization in the presidential system that has the two mega party. Likewise, here in Korea as well, of course, uh, by its nature, uh, as a divided nation, you know, anything can be more polarized here in this country. But um, especially, um, you know, regarding the North Korea related issue, um, the, the public opinion can be easily uh, polarized. So that's number one point I'd like to highlight. Uh, because, um, again, as we all know, the presidential uh, election is coming. Um, as we all know, again, the, because of the uh, uh, President Park has impeachment, uh, the presidential election was rescheduled. So the new election is on uh, March 9, which means we only have like approximately eight months left uh, before the election, which means you know, probably from like a September, mid September or October, you know, any Korean media or Korean public opinion will go to the, uh, again, the election, election, election. So that means that indicates that, um, again, if we want to really resume the dialogue uh, with the North Korea, um, truly this summer uh, might be really the last chance uh, for uh, the incumbent government um, or even for the Washington 401 because if we miss this summer, um, again, anything uh, that related to the North Korea can be overly politicized uh, because of the election mood. And um, again, if, if the new government comes in, again, we need to again to readjust all those um, opinions uh, between the uh, Washington and Seoul. So again, number one point I'd like to highlight is again, the domestic politics together with the timeline. And number two point is again, can we really reorient um, this, this COVID-19 uh, related health crisis as a new opportunity 
to resume the dialogue. As, um, as the professor Moon jong in mentioned, of course, vaccine, food shortage, uh, or fertilizer, all this is humanitarian aid. I, I can't agree more with the Professor Moon's that kind of you know, suggestion, but I'm a little skeptical about a possibility. Um, you know, can you really uh, use those kind of softer uh, humanitarian aid as the really the, uh, the factor that can bring back uh, the uh, conversation uh, with the North? Again, as Professor Moon already pointed out, um, their fundamental concern is absolutely our hostile policy, uh, which is related to the joint exercise. So probably without uh, mentioning or well, without suggesting something that related to the joint exercise scheduled in August, probably and will be pretty unlikely uh, to um, can to be able to have uh, another like a dialogue with the North. So again, the package can be a uh, humanitarian aid, but again, the core uh, should be um, related to the uh, joint exercise like uh, more military related issue. Um, as long as again, the, their um, message um, has been coherently highlighting that part. And number three, um, the, the, the third point is again, the US-China rivalry, which is actually my major concern, the biggest concern. Um, again, we have, um, you know, um, observed uh, the, the Korea-US um, summit and the G7 summit um, was another like uh, interesting event to take a look into. And U.S.-China rival is, you know, probably it would be difficult to deny all this, the, the reality. My, my concern is, you know, what if Washington um, put the, uh, any, no, anything North Korea related, uh, related under or after the China related issue? Um, that's actually my concern and not, that is not, I don't think it's my own, <laughs> you know, my concern alone and many other probably um, Korean policymakers also are concerned about that. You know, my suggestion is um, North Korea, China, um, should not be regarded as a one set. We all know the delicate, complicating, sensitive, um, difficult uh, relationship between North Korea and the China. That's not fully just friendly or it's not fully complementary. So as long as, long as um, their relationship is complicating, and my suggestion is we need to really um, use North Korea um, as a, another like a factor that can contribute to this on this more like um, how would you say more um, more bigger game again the bigger rivalry uh, between the U.S. and the China. That was my third point. And the lastly lessons from our history. Uh, if we go back to the Hanoi No Deal, um, my um, actually observation was, again, of course, I, I do think my government, South Korean government, has worked pretty rigorously uh, to make a kind of linkages uh, between the uh, Pyongyang and Washington and to, you know, to make the opportunity. Um, but uh, the thing was, again, the, there was a gap uh, between the Pyongyang and Washington and even between us and Washington. So right, Dr. Lim, if you could yes. wrap up, please, if you could Yes, wrap I'm up. gonna wrap up, yes. Um, so my, again, the last suggest suggestion is definitely uh, the coordination Washington and Seoul should be done first. Uh, uh, before uh, we move on to just, you know, resuming uh, the dialogue uh, with the Pyongyang, because that's not really the goal um, for, for everybody, you know, that of course, you know, opening the dialogue, having a dialogue is one, one way uh, to, to really, um, one good way and one important way uh, to solve the situation, but that should not be really regarded as the goal. So that would be my probably uh, concluding remark. Okay, I'm looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Susan Thornton is now next. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moon. And it's really great to be here with old friends and colleagues, my morning, uh, evening for some of us. Um, you know, the question is how to jumpstart diplomacy with the North. And, and I'll be brief in my remarks because I think the discussion is going to be uh, really interesting. But 
I'm going to focus my remarks on the on the U.S. and the domestic situation in the U.S. and with respect to how that affects our foreign policy and including the issue with North Korea. Um, you know, first, unlike in the Trump administration, I do not think that the Biden administration wants to, at this moment, prioritize uh, negotiations with North Korea. They don't exclude it, but um, you know, they are facing a lot of domestic demons that they have to battle. And there are other foreign policy issues that are in the priority list above North Korea at this point. Um, of course, uh, as Frank Alm said, you know, usually we get to diplomacy with North Korea through a crisis. And I don't think that this administration wants to have that crisis. Uh, they know well that North Korea can provoke a crisis when they think that people are not thinking enough about them. So they would like to stave off a crisis, but um, trying to get to uh, active diplomacy with North Korea is just, I mean, it, it's desirable, but it's, they've just got so many other pressing challenges. I mean, so I think to get diplomacy going with the North Korea, we really have to get a lot more consensus first inside the United States and then with our partners on how to approach North Korea than what we've got right now. And the reason is because, I mean, here we are at the beginning again with North Korea and it, it's almost like every time, at least speaking for the US, you know, we don't learn anything from what's gone on before and we need to learn those lessons. Um, you know, we, we need more time than four years to conduct this negotiation with North Korea. I think we've clearly seen that. So we need a long-term plan for how we're gonna get, um, you know, this problem uh, laid out and negotiated and, and on the road to resolution. But it, it's a long-term process. And uh, to do that, you know, we need to have uh, minds, you know, concentrated and focused, and we need to uh, come up with, I think, a workable plan that we can shop around to our partners and our allies and our friends and other parties that are interested in this issue, which includes a lot of people in the international community, and get a lot more consensus. And if we get more partners involved in this, it's going to help the US come up with a more realistic approach to this issue, which in my view, we've never had, uh, which is part of the problem. So while we're doing that, there are several things we can do to set a better stage for negotiations with North Korea. First and foremost, get the JCPOA with Iran restored. I mean, I, I think that goes to the issue of can the US even approach a negotiation on a complicated issue like this um, with such a complicated negotiating history uh, with any kind of credibility. And you know, we have to show that US negotiations and agreements can hold. Um, and they've got to get the Iran agreement, I think, uh, back on the books before we can really have a lot of success on the North Korea nuclear issue. Um, second, many people have mentioned already, you know, we've got to get COVID under control. And um, COVID, as we were coming on this program this morning, we we're talking about the appalling lack of kind of international solidarity on dealing with COVID. I mean, this is going to be an issue with respect to North Korea and vaccines, um, you know, because we know that North Korea is not going to want intrusive monitoring of vaccine uh, distribution and uh, implementation. So um, that is going to create a lot of problems for, I think, uh, international agencies and outside donors on the humanitarian assistance front. And um, this could become a negative issue, not a, pro not a positive issue. So I think we need to uh, think, I mean, I would like to see the international community give vaccines to North Korea without a lot of conditionality attached to them. But I don't, I don't have a high expectation that that will be the road that we'll be going down. And I think that that's really important. Um, you know, we do need to, as I said, get a workable plan in place. I'd like to see a roadmap developed that parties, you know, while we're waiting for North Korea to come back to the table, which could be a long wait, given, as Dr. Lim said, the domestic politics situation in South Korea, you know, they may be waiting for quite a while to see what's going to happen in various Sorry, places. Yeah. 
Ambassador Thornton, if you would wrap up, please. Sure. So I think my emphasis is on coming up with a workable plan that's more realistic in the time that we're spending waiting and not just let the ball be in North Korea's court. Over. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to all of you. And again, I, my apologies for having disappeared. Um, I only caught uh, tidbits of your presentations until um, I was able to re-enter. So if I uh, miss something important, I apologize. If I repeat something that was uh, already addressed, um, please just move on. So this portion uh, is a roundtable discussion among the panelists. And I had already sent you some questions to consider. Um, Dr. Lim kindly already began to answer them. And what I'd like to do is focus on the domestic politics, the domestic politics of each country involved or the major countries involved in, um, in dealing with North Korea. And I'd first like to ask Professor Moon, Moon Jung-in, um, whom we all know um, has a lot of expertise, not only academic expertise, but policy think tank, um, as well as his um, good columns uh, in different journals and newspapers. Professor Moon, you wrote, um, or rather you gave an interview recently and you stated that uh, North Korea is undergoing some internal um, political reforms. Um, and I wanted to follow up and ask you your thoughts on what you think these uh, so-called reforms toward, I think you called it normalization of the political system, what they might mean internally and what kinds of what kind of an impact they might have if they are to continue on the foreign policy um, possibilities. And I would argue that the North Korea has been abnormal country and North Korea has been irregular country, particularly since the days of Ados March in 1994 and after. Military politics is abnormal politics. Therefore, Kim Jong-un wanted to turn it back to the people first politics, okay? And also North Korea is a party state, Leninist party state. Then party should be in full control of the state, military, and the people. But the party has been somewhat, has become somewhat dysfunctional during the days of Kim Jong-il, even the, during the days of Kim Jong-un. Therefore, he wanted to, you know, bring back the primacy of the party, of the state and the military, and that is taking place. And also the, the very fact that he introduced the first you know, secretary uh, in the in the Politburo, that's another good sign because he cannot run the you know, show by himself and for himself. Therefore, he needs someone who can you know, you know, work on behalf of him on various you know, issues in a way he can you know, spread his risk too. Therefore, given all these kinds of things, for example, some people argue that uh, as a result of eighth, eighth Party Congress, and the North Korea has been consolidating state power over the economy, therefore going back to the old socialist control of the economy, I think that's wrong. Because there are so many irregular elements like party economy, military economy, therefore North Korea economy had become fractured and fragmented. Therefore, he wanted to, he wanted to bring back unified leadership of the state over the economic issues, not party, okay? But I think that's a good, good sign. Therefore, maybe under one thing, the crisis has been driving Kim Jong-un to pay more attention to domestic issues so that you know, he can come up with some kinds of overhauling of a party state system so that he can respond to the external pressures and challenges. But again, the uh, whole point is COVID-19, okay? And they're so fearful of, you know, Influsion of you know the the virus from outside. Therefore, it has been too much overly product, pro protective. That is why it has fun, it has fundamentally limited interaction with outside world. And in fact, you know the reason why North Korea is not responding to the U.S. call and South Korean call, it can be partly you know, attributed to the COVID-19 situation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if I can follow up on your uh, the last part of your comments on um, North Korea's resistance um, to the world uh, because of COVID. Um, hypothetically, if uh, North Korea remains shut, if it maintains its shut borders for another year, another year and a half, who knows, given the uh, slowness of uh, the accessibility to vaccines, um, 
what would that mean for the possibility of um, restarting negotiations? Um, um, perhaps Dr. Lim and um, Frank Om. Hey, well, um, you know, their economy situation absolutely cannot be, cannot be um, sustainable. But um, for the other uh, roundtable discussion, I mentioned this um, full, but, you know, we, the rest of the world, always are trying to analyze North Korea's economy with our standard or with our um, mechanism. But, you know, their economy is pretty much different from any, any other country's economy, which means what I'm trying to say, say is, um, even though the rest of the world will be just, you know, tilting the head until when they can just really survive or not, but still they have been surviving. And I do think, you know, they're somewhat, they're going to be surviving um, uh, with some, some methods. Um, having said that, you know, um, you know, with what kind of um, approach or with what kind of incentives can we really resume the dialogue? If I go back to our earlier that question. that the North Koreans are cheaters and we can't deal with them because they cheat and pressure is the right way to approach uh, North Korea. And Assistant Secretary or the nominee for the Assistant Secretary of State, Dan Crittenberg, in his uh, testimony uh, today said that sanctions and secondary sanctions in particular are a useful tool in dealing with North Korea. I think you know there is that consensus in the Senate that sanctions is uh, one of the most appropriate tools to use against North Korea. Um, it's obvious or it, it's understandable and natural because that's how the legislation works. They have the power to legislate sanctions and so they're gonna use that tool. Um, so there's that consensus there and we're gonna have to overcome that perception that we can't negotiate with North Korea. I think that's a, that's a, that's a difficult perception to overcome. But also I think there is a growing grassroots advocacy uh, movement in support of things like an end of war declaration, stronger engagement, less restrictions on humanitarian assistance, and, and working on things like divided families and re remains recovery operations. These efforts aren't the dominant voice in the US, but I think they're growing. I think they're substantial and may become a stronger vo uh, voice over time. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, Professor Thornton, um, I'll offer you the professor title uh, since you are at Yale Law School. Um, um, would you give us your thoughts on uh, the domestic politics within the US um, in addition to what um, Frank said about consensus? And I had, a, I had a feeling, I don't know, an intuition that you might be talking about a larger 
a need for a consensus, uh, a positive consensus rather than right. the negative consensus that Frank um, addressed. So if you could um, go on a bit. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I'm talking not about a consensus in the Senate. The consensus in the Senate is the one we need to get rid of, frankly. Um, <laughs> You know, so that's the problem really is, is that the consensus in the Senate sets up a situation that makes a negotiation with North Korea absolutely impossible because we're not willing to give the North Koreans anything. Um, and, you know, that's just not a recipe for a successful negotiation. I mean, I've done negotiations, some have been successful. Um, you have to have something to give in a negotiation if you want to succeed. And the pattern that we've had and the reason why we've had these succession of failures is because, frankly, we're just not willing to give them anything. And when we start to get a little bit of progress, we come up with more things that we want. So, I mean, the structure of the negotiation is impossible. And I mean, until we can get our part, because I don't think inside the U.S. the political situation is going to allow us to come to a more realistic assessment of what a negotiation would look like and what our priority goal should be and what we might have to give up to get that. And so other, other countries have a more realistic assessment of this. They can see much more clearly through the domestic politics, you know, what a successful negotiation might look like. And you know, we need those partners to keep working, frankly, on, on the people who are like the Senate, the problem in my view, um, you know, and, and let us know that basically what, you know, if you really want to get denuclearization of North Korea, you have to structure it differently. Maybe we don't really want to get denuclearization of North Korea. I don't know, but certainly today, there's really no indication that there's any realistic thinking about what would be need, need to be in the equation to get that goal. And, okay. and that's what I'm talking about. Could I follow up um, on that? Uh, could you specify what you mean by other countries um, that have a better understanding of what negotiations might look like with the DPRK? What, what, I mean, what are some specifics? Yeah, pretty much any country that we've interacted with that's been interested in this issue and some have very direct interests. Obviously, South Korea is one. They know North Korea very well. And they've been doing this you know, with us from the very beginning. So they have a pretty realistic assessment of, you know, what's going to fly and what's not. But there's also a lot of other, um, you know, semi-interested and interested parties. I mean, the, the Chinese actually have been big advocates of this roadmap and coming up with how we're going to trade off, you know, one thing for another thing and set up a process and get to some long-term outcome. Um, I think the Russians are very good diplomats and quite constructive on this issue. They're very interested in maintaining stability on the Korean Peninsula and maintaining stability on the border, the small border, but still a border that they have with North Korea. Um, and so they are quite creative in setting up diplomatic negotiations. Um, you know, they don't always have US interests top of mind, but they are quite good in these multilateral fora. We're working with them in the Iran negotiations and uh, my colleagues tell me they've been helpful, but also the Europeans, the UN, I mean, there are no, no end of actors that have been involved with us in this over the long haul and who, you know, have learned some things and know some things and, and have a better grasp on reality, frankly, than the U.S. does in its current pretty much debilitated domestic political state. And I think North Korea is one of these issues that just gets weaponized in our domestic politics. And it's very hard to, you know, set up something rational when you're faced with that. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move on to um, the regional and geopolitical context that um, can affect any kind of interaction with uh, the DPRK, whether it's the US or South Korea. So most of you have mentioned um, the tensions between uh, China and the United States, what um, I might call a, a rivalry um, that's become more intensified of late. And as we all know, with President Biden um, having just been in Europe with his EU partners, um, we're beginning to see a US-led, um, I won't say a wall, but a lineup of allies who want to position themselves vis-a-vis um, -vis China as, possible, uh, as a possible deterrent or uh, what the Chinese might call a, you know, back to Cold War tactics. 
Uh, on the other hand, we see China and Russia partnering up in more intense, intensified ways. And we have additional developments with China's increased military activities around Taiwan. So obviously we have a lot of issues, um, geopolitical issues in the region uh, that could affect um, any kind of interaction with North Korea. So I'm hoping that all the panelists could address this. And um, we know that um, Susan Thornton is an expert on China as well as Taiwan. Um, I'd like to get uh, everyone's thoughts on this intensified US PRC rivalry. Um, and very pointedly, if some, some kind of a military crisis breaks out over Taiwan, what does that do to our dealings with the US's dealings with South Korea as well as potentially North Korea to start? Professor Moon? Well, the Susan, you, you're asking Susan to give a comments. No, no. Oh, you no, I was asking. Ahead. I was asking you, Professor Moon, to start your comments so she could catch her breath and we'll catch up with her. No, you know, the, the harder the US-China strategic rivalry, okay, uh, it will be more difficult for the Korean Peninsula. It's a very simple logic, okay? If the United States tries to, you know, maximize US, Japan, South Korean trilateral corporations, particularly over the issues of cross-trade relations and South China Sea, East China Sea, then it's obvious that China will be strengthening its uh, northern trilateral you know, cooperation with Russia and North Korea. Therefore, we have a southern axis composed of US, Japan, South Korea, and northern axis uh, composed of China, Russia, and North Korea. But, that being the case, then that will be a kind of security nightmare to South Korea. Then, North, then China will be extending its military assistance to North Korea, which never happened in the past, since 19, 1958. Nine, since 1958, there's no evidence that North Korea provide, uh, China provide North Korea with uh, military weapons or other logistic support. Russia did, but not China. But think about it, China supporting North Korea in terms of weapons and logistics. Then we'll be facing a dual threat from North Korea, okay? One is a conventional threat and you no know, nuclear threat. And plus think about China becoming in a hostile relations with South Korea. Then we got to think about the Chinese theater threat in the West Sea. It's totally unacceptable to us, that is, that is why you know, our government strongly opposed the advent of a new Cold War, Cold War in this part of the world. And we should avoid the rise of any kinds of so-called new Cold War between Beijing and Washington in, for whatever means. Otherwise, it will be very, very difficult. And also, most importantly, there's no way to solve the North Korean nuclear issue. The American strategic rivalry with China in particularly geopolitical arena, will help North Korea consolidate its nuclear weapons. Then all this denuclearized Korean Peninsula will be totally far-fetched goal. Therefore, both from both conventional and nuclear, all this strategic rivalry, the worst in the strategic rivalry between China and the US is not good for us. Thank you. Um, very. Uh... Uh, full of gravitas, your answer, <laughs> and very realistic also um, projections. Um, Frank Gom, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I mean, I could be the outlier here, um, but I think, you know, poor US-China relations certainly doesn't help make progress on North Korea. But that being said, good or relatively good US-China relations, as we saw under the uh, Obama administration doesn't necessarily guarantee progress on North Korea either, right? Ultimately, I think China will pursue its own interests. So if the U.S. insists on pressuring North Korea and China for that matter, then China will not want to cooperate. Beijing, you know, I don't think they believe pressure works on North Korea. Uh, Beijing certainly doesn't uh, respond well when it, it itself is pressured. So, you know, I think if the U.S. instead seeks Beijing's cooperation, 
uh, in getting North Korea back to the table through incentives or uh, you know, other tension reduction measures, then I think there is room for progress. And it could be a case where working on this issue set could actually help improve US-China relations. Well, Frank, I love outliers, at least intellectual outliers. So thank you for that. Um, Susan Thornton, if you could also bring in Taiwan now. Sure, and Frank, I don't think you're an outlier in this group. Um, definitely um, the US-China rivalry is gonna make it harder to solve the North Korea problem. The Chinese are not gonna cooperate in the current environment. Um, you know, the Taiwan issue is, um, I don't think totally, um, you know, it's a, it's a potential flashpoint that's out there, but I don't, see it as being uh, directly connected to the, the North Korea issue. But it is interesting that in the recent summit joint statement that Taiwan and concern about peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait was, was mentioned for the first time. Um, and of course, since the US um, is hosted by South, you know, US military bases are hosted by South Korea, um, you know, it raises a number of questions probably in some people's minds that probably Korea would not like to have raised actually. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that anyone thinks that, and certainly um, when Korean officials are responding on this issue, they would tell you that there is no military implication. In, in other words, there's no implication with respect to US military bases in Korea in a Taiwan contingency, but um, you know, it, it is, um, it is a, a new development that, that that statement was made uh, in the joint statement after the summit. So I think, you know, certainly no one wants a crisis with respect to Taiwan. No one wa <coughs> sorry, wants a crisis on the Korean Peninsula either. <coughs> and I think that um, Frank is right. Most countries in the region think that US-China escalating rivalry is gonna be bad for them. It's definitely gonna be bad for solving the North Korea problem. Thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Lim, if I know that you are an expert on Japan as well as uh, many other um, countries and issue areas like arms control, um, could you talk a little bit about Japan's uh, role, um, what you might see in the future, especially with the US-China rivalry? Hmm. Japan's role, well, well, it's a very, um, how would you say, difficult question to answer. Well, just um, very, very briefly. We only yes, have about five minutes left. Yeah, sure. Um, but if we recall again the, the Hanoi No Deal, um, again, there are many probably reasonable doubts uh, about what exactly Japan did. <laughs> um, you know, did they really play their veto? Veto player like uh, role, I mean, behind the curtain or in Washington. There, are, I think, uh, certainly there are many uh, people who are doubting about that kind of, again, the negative um, side of the uh, Japan's position um, in this process. If we record, you know, some people. Um, um, I would just say positively evaluate the six party talks again the China definitely um, contributed as a chair and the you know all these parties involved came in again including Japan so some of course um, th there are some positive evaluations about the six party talk but I'm a little actually skeptical about that approach because you know back then the six party talks uh, China US the situation China U.S. relation was totally different from the today's uh, U.S.-China relation. That's number one reason. And number two is again the um, again the Japan's Japan's role here, uh, because as long as um, Japan's conservative, uh, pretty nationalistic, historically revisionistic um, conservative do think uh, China as the major threat, again that they um, tend to tend to. Um, 
tend to prioritize North Korea threat as a more like immediate immediate one. So um, having said that, uh, I, I do also recommend for my for my government. I always have recommended that again. We also need to persuade Tokyo also uh, as as long as they can play some veto again the veto card. So that would be my uh, comment about that Thank question. You. Mm -hmm. Um, in the remaining four minutes, because I really would like to try to get the Q&A started by 10.10, I'll, I'll push it to 10.11. Um, if you all could come up with a one minute response um, uh, about my, my third question and last question to the panel is about history. Um, what can we learn from past history, the efforts at diplomacy and negotiations with Pyongyang? Uh, that have already been attempted? And perhaps more importantly, uh, what are the approaches and mechanisms that have not been tried or not in a genuine way uh, that might yield a more positive move? Let's say we don't have the COVID border lockdown in North Korea. Let's say that many of these, um, hopefully what will change, the, the changeable conditions will change for the better. Still, what are the things we've tried that uh, give us good lessons to think about? And what have we not tried that we should really try to employ? Um, Frank Gong, we'll start with you. We'll go to um, Susan Thornton, uh, um, Jung Lim, and to Professor Moon last. Okay, really briefly, what works? You know, I think common sense diplomacy. Engagement works more than isolation. North Korea doesn't respond well to pressure. I think bilateral engagement uh, is more effective rather than getting bogged down, at least initially in multilateral talks. Uh, exchanging concessions, you know, based on proportionality, reci uh, reciprocity, step-by-step um, -step phased approaches, that tends to be more productive than grand bargains or the Libya model. Uh, elevating the goal of peace and, uh, uh, and tension reduction uh, to the same level as denuclearization also creates that level of reciprocity. I mean, this is just common sense diplomacy and, and nothing new. So trying to portray this calibrated practical approach as something new is, is I, don't, I don't think that's correct. In terms, I think that the challenge is trying to see what we can do beyond the common sense diplomacy, right? Some people argue that Trump was unconventional and bold, uh, especially with the leader level summit, but it didn't work. But I'd argue that the failure at Hanoi doesn't mean that presidential summits don't work. It means that there wasn't enough perseverance, right? You know, the two leaders were in Hanoi uh, talking for several hours over a couple of days. I mean, we've seen like people at the Camp David uh, for the courts talking over weeks, right? The meetings between Gorbachev and Reagan and Bush were multiple, me multiple meetings over years, uh, many days. Um, I feel like, you know, when in Hanoi, we saw Trump distracted by the, the Michael Cohen testimony. He was thinking more about how to get out of there as soon as possible, being the one who breaks up with Kim Jong-un before he's broken up with. I think uh, you know, there's some important lessons and we should not uh, take the wrong lessons out of Hanoi. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to um, uh, Dr. Lim. You're okay. 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 My my final comment is um, absolutely as I already mentioned. Again, the Washington solo coordination should be done first. I'm not saying then you know um, we should, for example, ignore whatever Japan's concern is or like whatever China's concern is, whatever Russia's concern is. I do, of course, know, I mean, the, each party has its concern, but so we don't want to be disrespectful uh, to the uh, uh, regional member. But again, the number one priority is definitely we need to uh, narrow our cognitive dissonance first between, again, the Washington and Seoul. And then we're going to move on to the Pyongyang, and then we're going to probably uh, persuade the other related uh, parties as well. So that'll be my final comment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was having trouble. Susan Thornton, Thornton, please. Sure, well, I think my main piece of advice would be that we need to narrow down the goal. So uh, to my mind, the goal should be, um, you know, 
limiting or removing the nuclear program without a conflict. That should be the goal. That should be the only thing we really focus on. And then once you have a narrower goal, this is an extremely complicated negotiation. It's, there's a lot of technical work that needs to be done in the process. There's a lot of education on both sides that needs to be done. It's a long-term process. We need to get a consensus around the goal and then we can start thinking about how to reach that goal. But until we narrow down what the negotiation is about on our side, um, there's no hope of, of, of having a successful negotiation. And Professor Moon. The US alone cannot solve the North Korean nuclear problem. US, Japan, South Korea, and trilateral coordination can, cannot solve the North Korean problem. Even including North Korea, the four party cannot solve the problem. As Susan pointed out, China and Russia should be in. And they should be new leveling up of six party talks. You know, Leon Siegel and Thomas Pickering, Morton Halperin, Peter Hayes have been proposing that the six party you know, security summit in Northeast Asia. North Korean nuclear issue cannot be resolved without reference to broad comprehensive security framework in Northeast Asia. Therefore, on the one hand, I agree with Susan, we need to be more realistic, practical, and intersubjective okay, in, in order to solve the problem. But there can be a jump start for bilateral talks, but eventual solution to the North Korean nuclear problem, including such as a nuclear weapons free zone on the Korean Peninsula, nuclear weapons free zone in Northeast Asia, that would be kind of the goal we should strive toward. In order to achieve that kind of things, we should have no station security summit talks. That can help alleviate US-China strategic rivalry too. Thank you very much to all our panelists. And now we will uh, move on to the Q&A section until about 10.25 PM. Um, so we have some uh, questions from the audience and I'm going to pick two at a time to offer to our panelists. Panelists, if you could please keep your answers very brief so that different uh, panelists can have a, a turn. Um, so we have a question from uh, Lee Siegel and I'll paraphrase uh, that he points out that um, President Biden is meeting with um, Putin um, who's been, uh, again, officially uh, recognized, uh, Russia has been recognized um, in the uh, NATO meetings as a, a, an official adversary. So why not extend uh, an invitation to meet person to person with Kim Jong-un, a Biden-Kim Jong-un meeting? That's one question to consider. Um, this particular question is from Donna Knox for Frank Um. You mentioned humanitarian engagement and included resumption of remains recovery operations. Um, how could, should the US approach this issue so that it is productive and de-linked from denuclearization both now and going forward? <sighs> and if I may add on, um, Hal Healy also uh, addressed uh, the remains issue, the remains recovery, but also other uh, what we might call small molehill uh, issues, not the big mountain issues uh, such as denuclearization. Is there a way to build up more trust and a working relationship by focusing on these um, so-called smaller issues, whether it's uh, remains recovery, agricultural assistance, health assistance, uh, and so forth? Um, so why don't we start with um, the Lee's question um, about the possibility, desirability of a Biden Kim meeting? Um, Professor Moon and um, and Susan Thornton, I will um, throw you that question. Yeah, that is you know, excellent idea. That is what I and you know Susan have been talking about. You know, if you cannot solve the North Korea problem, ask help from Beijing and Moscow. They have a better connections. Yes, I strongly support that idea. Okay, thank you for that short answer, Susan. Susan? So I thought the question was about a Biden Kim Jong un meeting. Yes. Um, and I think, from my perspective, I mean, we saw this. I don't have anything really against such a meeting, but I, you know, I think this negotiation is going to be, you know, extremely 
long and involved and complicated. And I don't think you can have, I mean, there is a mismatch in our systems, right? The US president has to take care of the whole world. Kim Jong-un is pretty focused on a, on, on a narrower set of challenges. Um, but you know, to have President Biden meet Kim Jong Un early on, I I actually think that that's um, not the way to go. I would prefer to see Biden's energy on this issue put into developing this you know consensus for a long term negotiation that I've been talking about. I, I just really think we need to have a plan and get responsible people in Congress to be on board with it and get our allies on board with it, and then. You know, Biden can launch a process that's going to take probably longer than his, um, you know, I don't know how long his administration will be, but it'll take probably longer than just a couple of years. Thank you. Um, two more questions uh, for the panel. Uh, one is from an anonymous attendee. The panelists have raised Congress as the problem, but in some ways they are the key to ensuring a longer term strategy. And Susan Thornton emphasized that very much. How do we shift that consensus um, among the lawmakers to towards something that allows for more continuity across administrations um, of different parties? It's one question. Um, and uh, another question regarding sanctions and uh, the need for the DPRK's need for currency. Um, is it possible that a sanctions exemption um, might be a way of getting the DPRK back to the dialogue. Uh, Frank, we'll start with you. Yeah, and I'll quickly respond to the previous question about humanitarian engagement. So I think, you know, ideally we'd like to subscribe to the, the principle that we separate uh, humanitarian assistance from politics and we and instead we, we provide assistance based on uh, necessity and, and proportionality and, rest, and and these principles that are you know humanitarian principles. Unfortunately, I think just the way the U.S. government has worked is uh, and and the North Korean government for that matter is that they link these two issues. And so I think to the extent that we can continue to separate them, the better it is. That's, that's not a helpful response, but that's just that's the reality. Uh, in terms of uh, influencing Congress, I think you know. Every U.S. citizen has a right to petition their government. Um, so I think that's, that's a role for advocacy. Um, and I, again, I alluded to a lot of grassroots organizations that have been uh, lobbying uh, Congress for what they believe in. I also think presenting the facts. There are many academic studies out there, longitudinal studies that look at the impact of U.N. sanctions and how ineffective they are. You know, it could be anywhere from 5% uh, to 30% in terms of changing uh, major behavior from uh, rogue nations. So presenting this information, certainly we have empirical evidence over the last 10 years uh, in terms of how they impact uh, North Korea. Uh, I think uh, our representatives need to know this information. Thank you very much. Um, Susan, any thoughts uh, on the issue of, um, of getting uh, okay. uh, members of Congress to take on a more longer term strategic view? Um, I, I think um, there are people in Congress that are very interested in this issue and have been following it for a long time and could, um, you know, be more um, involved in leading a, this kind of a consensus. The problem is that there are also a lot of people who, you know, see are not as maybe interested in getting to the end result or interested in using this issue for other reasons um, in whatever calculus they have in the configurations that happen up on Capitol Hill. And so I think trying to, um, you know, as Frank said, bring back diplomacy, get the American people to be insisting more to Congress that we need to be pursuing a foreign policy of stability that involves working out problems through negotiations and, dot and discussions and not always reaching for some kind of, you know, punitive tool or military tool. I mean, th these are the kinds of things that we need to get sort of back to that we've been getting away from. And I think they um, all relate to the issue of North Korea, um, unfortunately, and it's gonna be difficult to, to move that needle back in the direction that I think most Americans, frankly, through the recent 
series of elections we've had in our country have been showing that they want, which is to get away from sort of foreign adventurism and get back to focusing on issues at home um, and work through diplomacy to solve these problems. And we need to do that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lim, I'm going to pose uh, this question to you um, about uh, humanitarian and other smaller steps. Um, uh, NCNK members very much believe that these smaller steps, the non-nuclear emphasis, can help pave uh, some kind of a path um, toward more trust and more constructive interactions um, with the DPRK. But in your comments, you uh, mentioned at least twice that you believe that they are not necessarily the way to go, that they won't be as effective in dealing with North Korea. Could you tell us why specifically in, in a very brief comment? Well, the number one reason I, uh, first, I think so is um, I'm not again denigrating all this contribution um, that can made, can be made by the uh, NGO groups or other those non-governmental uh, player. Uh, but the thing is, um, again, the, the North Korea itself is uh, is a such authoritarian regime and is a pretty much unusual state. And also another thing is how really consistently. Uh, those kind of efforts can be made uh, by the non-government actor. That's another like a kind of concern. Uh, you know, this presidential system, Korea and the United States, you know, from probably North Korea's point of view, we are kind of fully flops, you know, for, for during some period of time, you're like a more dovish, but for, for the another like time, you know, we have more like a hawkish. So um, how really consistently uh, we can uh, make some signals to the uh, the Pyongyang. That's more probably important, um, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's very helpful. Thank you. This, this is the last question uh, we have time for. Um, this question is from Grace Kang. The Biden administration has put higher priority on human rights. And it, I would assume uh, then uh, she means compared to the last administration. And it is expected to appoint a special envoy on North Korean human rights. How should the problem of North Korean atrocities be incorporated into US diplomacy on North Korea? Um, I offer this uh, uh, question partly because we have not raised human rights um, in this discussion and uh, we want to be inclusive about all the issues that we care about. Um, I'm going to offer this question to um, Frank Om and Chung and Moon, and then uh, I will turn the, um, the mic over to uh, Keith. Yeah, so I, I think human rights must be incorporated into the broader security discussions, not only from a moral uh, perspective, but increasingly from a legal and political perspective. There is um, prohibitions against sanctions relief uh, in the North Korea uh, Sanctions and Policy en Enhancement Act. So we can't actually make progress on relieving US unilateral sanctions unless North Korea, so that's just a practical matter, right? And then politically speaking, I think it's a lot easier for representatives to, if they ultimately need to uh, approve an agreement to, to do that, if there's some human rights uh, considerations in there, right? And it could start small with just accepting the envoys and then build, um, and then another possibility is, is going big and thinking about a broader Helsinki framework where we actually uh, explicitly include human rights as an exchange of concessions. But in that case, the US will really need to give up something big as well that North Korea wants. If you insist too much on human rights, you won't get anything. You won't get the denuclearization, you won't get human rights improvement. Therefore, we need to adopt a sequential approach you make a breakthrough by focusing on nuclear issues and build the confidence with North Korea. Then you can talk with the key North Korean figures about human rights. Then you will get some positive result. That is what happened in 2000 when Kim Dae-jung visited Pyongyang. In the private setting, we raised the issues. Unless you improve human rights conditions, there is no way for you to normalize ties with the United States. That, that friendly advice works better than in a hot stick pressure North Korea. Therefore, I can tell you, if you wanted to push both human rights and denuclearization, you don't get nothing. You need to be more wise and contextual. Well, 
You uh, let, me just, let, let me just add, it's not black or white. You can start, you know, at very small levers. It's not like you start negotiations with North Korea and then say, we're going to take Kim Jong-un to the International Criminal Court, right? You can start with asking, hey, how about accepting a meeting with an envoy, right? No, but the, the, the starting point is because North Korea has been chanting that the, remove hostile intent and policy. Human rights constitute the core of a hostile policy by the United States. Therefore, you know, can I just say that this is exactly what happens in every try when any ever anyone tries to set up a negotiation with North Korea? Like fifty people are lining up outside the door to raise additional issues, which is why I said we need to prioritize and focus on what the goal is and try to get that first, and then we can raise all these other issues. Our wish list is five miles long, and we don't have that much that North Korea wants. Thank I you agree. so much. Um, I, want, I want to thank they, everyone. Uh, Dr. Moon, thank you so much. And by the way, Kathy Moon, in terms of full transparency, she's one of my bosses at the National Committee of North Korea. She's part of the advisory committee. So thank you, Dr. Moon, for uh, moderating today. You know, Chairman Kim, in, in listening to the last few minutes here, perhaps our next joint meeting should be a debate. Maybe we should structure <laughs> this in a different way to provide more uh, uh, keen uh, back and forth. Uh, just a moment, Kathy, please. Um, but I do want to thank uh, East Asia Foundation. I want to thank Frank Om, Susan Thornton, Dr. Yun Jung Lim, Dr. Chung and Moon. Um, and before I have some additional final, final comments, Kathy. Oh, sorry to take up time. I was just going to say, I think our, our roundtable has been an, a, a, an excellent event. Um, it real Democracy lives in NCNK and the EAF. Thank you. Um, also, you know, I must, for just a moment, uh, take the prerogative of being a, a co-host of this event, just saying how impressed I was uh, with, with all of the comments, the insight of our presenters, the great questions. And a few of the takeaways for me, uh, pointing back to Frank Alm's earlier statement, there is a trust deficit uh, between the DPRK and the United States. At the end of the day, the North Koreans do not believe that the United States will deliver on an agreement. At the end of the day, the United States does not believe that North Korea will deliver its part of an agreement, which points to Susan Thornton's recommendations that this really must be a longer term uh, agreement. Uh, well, it's inevitable that any agreement will be longer term. Uh, we talk about the, the North Korea's demand for a security guarantee. Well, a security guarantee from the United States would go beyond any particular administration. All of this points, I think, at the end of the day, to the likelihood that the eventual resolution of issues on the Korean Peninsula uh, will 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 be composed of a multilateral approach. And when I say multilateral, that need not only include China and Russia, uh, Japan, uh, but countries outside the region as well. Uh, so with that provocative final comment, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank, uh, again, Esther M and uh, Chan Ku Kong for all of their work. And with that, uh, we are adjourned.